So regression analysis, next, next topic we're gonna to cover. So we're gonna talk about uh, concepts of re regression analysis. Again, what it is, um, we're gonna talk about some of the key assumptions and limitations that come along with regression analysis, and then we'll go through the procedures for doing a, a basic level of a linear regression analysis, and then you'll get to do that hands-on in the exercise that follows the break. So we're gonna talk about linear regression methods, um, linearization in order to, in order to get things linear so we can do linear regression and then a little bit about ways to quantify uncertainty in a regression uh, so regression analysis set of procedures we use to estimate the relationship between a response variable um, so in this example in this in this picture here on the screen it would be um, sea level uh, and one or more explanatory variables so in this simple example here in the plot, it's one explanatory variable, and that would be time on the horizontal axis. We typically use it for making predictions and sometimes for doing forecasting. So in this case, you know, you could potentially, um, if you had a, a, an analysis here, you could project this forward in time and, and make some sort of forecast about what, what future sea level might look like. Um, and then it's also sometimes used to infer a, um, a causal relationship between, uh, between the variables. And you'll get to see and use, play around with this data set um, that's shown in this fig figure in the uh, exercise today. So in regression analysis, we start by needing a model. So what's a regression model? So a regression model has a few key elements to it. And this is true for pretty much any regression model. You have to have a, uh, unknown parameters. Um, it could be um, one or more um, parameters. You have to have a dependent uh, variable. Um, so generally that's the Y variable is gonna be what we define as the dependent variable. And then you can have um, one or more independent or explanatory variables, right? So the idea here is if we know uh, the values of the independent variables, you know, X ex can help us explain or predict what the va value of Y might be. So you can write that out as an equation, right? Y equals some function of your um, explanatory variables and some parameters, usually, you know, coefficients of some sort, um, plus an error term. So anytime you're doing any kind of a model fit, regression is just a model, right? There's always um, errors in the model. So you wanna account for that with a, in regression analysis with this explicit error term. Other things we can calculate out of uh, regression models that, that we'll use um, along the way is residuals. So we touched on this concept a little bit earlier, but uh, a res residual is basically the um, observed value. Um, so your actual data uh, minus um, the value that was predicted by your model. So in this case, if you're doing some kind of, you know, fitting a line to some data, right, the residual would be for each data point, um, the, the difference between the, the point that you observed and what you predict with your fitted line. So the idea here conceptually is to find the function of the independent variables and the parameters that provides the best fit to your data that you're fitting it to. And, you know, there's different ways you can define what being the best fit uh, means and how you how you measure it. As with, as with anything, really, you always gotta be really cautious with extrapolation with any model. Uh, regression models are no exception. So if you're trying to make predictions outside of the range of your observations, um, you got to be a little bit cautious. That can be a slippery slope. Um, so you don't want to just do it and assume it's correct. You want to make sure that um, you're, if you're going to extrapolate that you have good reason to believe that your model is still going to be valid outside of the range of the data that you observed. Sometimes that's pretty reasonable, other times not so much. Uh, so for linear, linear or for regression, this is going to be the building blocks for um, linear regression, which is kind of the, the base level of regression analysis. Uh, 
So we need to start by defining what a linear combination is. So a linear combination is just any mathematical expression that is built by um, multiplying terms by a constant. So again, the, the same notation we had before, the x would be our independent explanatory variables, b would be um, the unknown parameters. So in this case, they're just coefficients. All right, so we multiply each, um, each uh, coefficient by our uh, independent variable, and then we sum them up, right? So that's the formal mathematical definition of a linear combination. Linear regression is basically when we do a regression analysis on a linear combination. So we call it linear because the underlying function, so the stuff on the right-hand side of the equation, is by definition a linear combination, right? So if we can write an expression this way, right, it's, it's considered a linear combination. So you can have cases where you can have, you can do regression on nonlinear things, right? So these, these X's um, can have exponents on them and it would still be a linear combination because you're multiplying the coefficient times X to some exponent and then adding the results. Uh, simple linear regression is probably the one most people are familiar with and have heard about at one point or another, otherwise commonly known as least squares analysis. So linear regression, simple linear regression is when you only have one explanatory variable, so only one independent variable or only one x variable. Right? So, so the way we write this formally is beta 0, which is a constant, uh, plus beta 1 times x1 plus the error term. So if you think about this in terms of like the least squares, like a, a, the usual way we might write an equation for a straight line, y equals mx plus b, right? This beta zero would be your b value, and this beta one value would be your m value, which is your slope, right? And then if you have more than one explanatory variable, we just call that multiple linear regression. We're not, we're gonna, not gonna do a, a deep dive on that. We're gonna focus just on the simple linear regression uh, in this course. So as I mentioned, ordinary least squares is probably the most well-known and common way to do linear regression problems for simple linear regression. Uh, the way we define the best model that fits our data is defined by minimizing the sum of the squared residuals. So again, we take the square of the residuals, so the observed versus the model, square it, sum it up, and then find the, the parameters, the betas, right? So in a simple, simple least squares, y equals mx plus b, right? We're trying to find the values of m and b, the slope and the intercept that minimize this sum of the square of residuals. And again, the reason we do squaring in these types of operations is because you can have positive and negative errors. So you can have uh, points where your observed is higher than the model and points where the observed is lower than the model. And if you just sum them up, those will cancel each other and it'll, it'll give you a false indication that the error is smaller than it really is. So by squaring it, um, it cancels, it, it prevents positive and negative errors from canceling out because everything ends up being positive. So that's why in these types of operations, things are squared. Uh, ordinary least squares, so there's two different, or there's two basic ways to, to solve an ordinary least squares problem. One is analytical, so uh, an ordinary least squares problem is simple enough that we can actually derive explicit equations to solve for the um, unknown parameters. And we're not going to go into the details of the derivation, but conceptually how you would do it is you would set the partial, this is like another maximum minimum problem, right? You'd set the partial derivatives um, equal to zero and then solve that system of equations to find the minimum um, on the square of the residuals. Or you can do it numerically, all right? So we'll see that later. At the end of the day, we'll have a lecture and an exercise tomorrow on some numerical methods uh, using Monte Carlo. So you can either use an optimization tool like Excel or other software or the Monte Carlo method, which is, you know, think of that as like a guess, a guess and check type of approach. Uh, just to highlight that there are some assumptions in least squares, these usually aren't an issue, but just to be aware that there are assumptions and if you violate any of these assumptions, ordinary least squares might not be the best choice. So obviously if we're 
doing a linear regression with ordinary least squares, we're assuming that the model is actually linear. Um, we're also assuming that the, our, um, our um, independent variables, so our x's, are not correlated um, with the error terms. Uh, we're also assuming that the errors in our model are normally distributed. So if we looked at the distribution of uh, the difference between our observed value and the value we get out of our model, we're assuming that those have a normal distribution and that on average the error is zero. So the, the mean is zero. We're assuming the error term has a constant um, variance. So we're assuming that the error has the same variability over all of our data. And we're assuming that uh, the errors are not um, correlated. The other big one too is that the, the X values, the independent variables, if we have more than, you know, if we're doing multiple linear regression, the independent variables should not be correlated too. So if you have, you know, if you're trying to use two predictive variables, X1 and X2, if X1 and X2 are highly correlated with each other, um, ordinary least squares is going to be a bit of a problem because essentially you're, you're uh, it's, it's in a loose sense, it's a little bit like um, kind of double counting the effect of the two variables, right? Because they both, they both are affecting the model in a similar way. Okay, so here's the, here's the analytical equations for ordinary least squares. You might vaguely remember seeing equations like this at some point in math class. So uh, for an ordinary least squares, our, our intercept is beta zero or commonly B. So we sum up our Y values, uh, multiply that by the sum of X squared minus the sum of the X times the sum of X times Y divided by N times the sum of X squared minus on the sum of X and then square that sum, right? So again, we, we're not gonna go over these in great depth, but these are, these are the explicit analytical solutions that you can use to solve any simple um, ordinary least squares that has just one, one um, independent explanatory variable. Coefficient of determination is one of the metrics we use to um, evaluate kind of the goodness of fit for uh, a regression analysis. So it has um, a couple of terms in it here on the right hand side. So it's a one minus this SSR over SST. So SSR is the sum of the square of the residuals, which we've already talked about. So you take uh, each data value, subtract, you know, the value um, you would predict uh, with your model, given the same X value, right? What would, what would the Y come out to be if you plugged it into your fit? Square that and then add them up over all your data. And then SST is called the total sum of the squares. So in this case, you're taking each data value uh, y and subtracting the mean of y, squaring that value, and then adding it up over all of your data. So that's how you calculate the coefficient of determination. Uh, generally, a value closer to one is better, but um, again, as with any, any metric, you, you want to use it with caution and um, just be aware that of some of the um, pitfalls that that can arise um, with some of these metrics. So, for example, uh, the R, this R squared, this coefficient of determination, um, can end up being high when your fit is um, can get anchored if you just have a few very large values that are outliers of sorts, and most of your data is clustered around smaller values. Um, those large values will kind of have an anchoring effect and will give you an inflated R squared value that might give you the false impression that your fit is better than it really is. So um, again, just be aware that these are not, um, these metrics aren't always a guarantee that it's a good fit. Linearization, I think I touched on this the first day. Um, this is just one application of linearization. So the idea is you try to find a linear approximation of your function in, in this case, so that we can use a simple linear regression model um, uh, or approach to fit, fit a model to our data. So here's just a, just a really simple example here. So here you have a, a function that's to a power, right? So you have y equals um, 
beta zero times beta one to the x power. So this is like a, it's like a, think of it as like a semi-log function um, is what this basically is, or a power function. So the way we can um, address this to linearize it is we can take um, the logarithm of both sides of our equation. So if we take the logarithm of both sides of the equation, we get the log of y. So the plot on the right here, we have plotted y in log space. We get um, the log of the co uh, each of the coefficients, and then x comes out by itself. So in this case, y is going to be in log space. x is still going to be in linear or real space. So you end up with this semi-log plot on the right, log on the y, um, real space or linear on the x. And you can see the data um, looks much more reasonable in terms of being a linear uh, function, which means then we could apply ordinary least squares to this data set with this as our um, function, right, to estimate uh, what these parameters are. So in this case, you know, in, in least squares, y would be log of y, right, beta, or uh, b, your intercept would be log of beta m would be log of beta 1. So when you estimate the, say, the slope of this line, right, that's the log of beta. So if you, uh, you would have to take the anti-log of that value to get the actual beta that you would plug in here on, if you're using the form of the equation here on the left-hand side, right? So you have to remember, you know, to, to do those, those transforms. But this, this just expands some of the, some of the utility of linear regression if you can, if you can find a linear representation of your of your function. Um, circling back to extrapolation here again, um, this will just show you just a real a real example where extrapolation can go awry. Um, so in this case, you know, choosing the right model if you're going to extrapolate, making making sure it's valid for extrapolation is important. So here's just a, a data set plotted here. You know, the, the tendency might be to, well, I can just go into Excel and pick a power function and it'll fit it for me. And I get this equation out. I get a really nice looking R squared, right? 0.999 almost, pretty close to one. So everything's fine and dandy. Um, the problem is this is um, annual maximum precipitation data, which normally we would fit to a generalized extreme value distribution. And so what would happen in this example is if you were just to use this little simple power function that you did a regression on the data, and let's say you had to extrapolate to the 0 0.001 or one in a 1,000 annual exceedance probability, you'd get close to 12 inches of precipitation. But that's not really a good model choice for this type of data, right? Generalized extreme value is, is a better model choice. So if you were to fit a generalized extreme value distribution to your data and extrapolate it to the same annual exceedance probability, you get a much different um, precipitation estimate when you um, try to extrapolate beyond your data, right? So in this specific example, the model on the right-hand side would be a much much better and much preferred model than the model on the left-hand side. So, and especially if, if you're going to extrapolate, right? If you're not going to extrapolate, there's probably not a huge difference in the two models. But if you're gonna, you know, if you have a, a need to extrapolate, the one on the right would be much preferred. So just because it looks like it's a good fit, especially when you're extrapolating, doesn't mean it's a good model. Okay, last topic we'll talk about is uncertainty. So there's different ways you can um, calculate and, and portray uncertainty in a regression analysis. One is you can show uncertainty in the model parameters. So the beta value, so like in a simple linear regression, the slope and the intercept. So this is just an example here of um, how, you, how you might calculate a confidence interval for the slope estimate. So given, um, given a data set, right, that estimate, um, has uncertainty in it. So if you want to portray that uncertainty, you can do it for any of these beta parameters, but this one would be um, just a just a example for you to see how to do one for the slope. So it's basically your your um, your fitted estimate. So that's what this beta one with a hat means. It means your your model estimate of the parameter. 
Uh, T is the student T distribution based on the one minus alpha over two, which is your confidence interval, and over two is based on the degrees of freedom, which is related to your number of data N. And then SE is the standard error of your, um, of your estimator. So again, T is student T, confidence interval is one minus alpha. So if you want a 90% confidence interval, that corresponds to alpha equals 0.1 because one minus 0.1 is 0.9, which then corresponds to an upper 95% confidence limit, one minus alpha over two, 0.95. And then the lower confidence uh, limit would be 0.05. Number of data that you have is N, which gives you N minus two um, degrees of freedom. And the N minus two, because you have um, two uh, two parameters in your model. You have a, a beta zero and a beta one. Uh, Excel has a built-in function for the student t distribution, t dot inverse. Um, and then just a, I guess, fun fact about the student t distribution. It's very similar to a normal distribution, except it has thicker tails uh, than a normal distribution. So out in the extreme kind of right and left side of the distribution, the tails are thicker. And as n gets large, um, the student t distribution um, approaches the normal. So when n goes to infinity, the student t is exactly a normal distribution. And once you get above, I don't know, 30, 40, maybe 50 for n, it's really close to a normal distribution. So you'll see sometimes in the literature, you'll see um, methods where they talk about using normal approximations. And a lot of times you'll see a rule of thumb that if you're sample size is greater than about 30, that some of these methods that use normal approximations are pretty good approximations. And so part of the reason for that is that's the size of, of N where the T distribution starts to get close enough to a normal distribution that if you just assume it's normal, you know, you're gonna be close enough for most applications. And then that we need the standard error. So the standard error um, is calculated this way. So it's the, um, again, the sum of the square of the residuals divided by the degrees of freedom n minus two, take the square root of that. And then in the denominator, we have the x values. So in this case, we have the residuals on the x, uh, the x value. So you just do it kind of the backwards, right? So you have each of your x data values um, minus the mean value of your x's um, squared. So, um, and then take the square root of that as well. So that gives you an estimate of the standard error for, for slope, and it'll, it'll work for, um, you can do this for other, other parameters in the model as well. Uh, the other way is you can show essentially intervals around your regression fit, so your regression line. There's two different types of intervals that you can use for that. They're called confidence and prediction intervals. Um, they're a little bit analogous to the confidence and credible interval concepts we talked about um, for frequentist and Bayesian statistics, although they're not exactly the same. Um, so here, the, the interval, uh, you're calculating the, an interval on Y that applies to a specific value of X. So you have to calculate this interval at each value of X because um, it will change uh, over different values of X. So lots of math in here. You don't have to, we don't have to dive deep into math, but it's just here for your reference. Um, so confidence intervals on a regression fit. What they mean is the probability that the average of all the possible values of Y will fall within the range, um, within the range of the confidence interval for a given value of X. So again, this is a little bit analogous to confidence intervals, right? So it's average over many over many possible trials or many possible values of Y. Um, and then you can see all the complicated formulas here, which you don't, you don't need to necessarily uh, worry about or memorize. And then the prediction interval, again, is a little bit analogous to the Bayesian credible interval, and it's the probability that a single observation of Y will fall within the range of the confidence interval given the value of X. And again, the confidence, or I'm sorry, the um, formulas are given here. There's some similarities, but they're also different in some key ways. Um, I think the key, the key point here, we'll 
touch on, or the key difference we'll touch on here on the next slide, um, or next couple slides. So, what kind of inferences can you make from these intervals? So, um, if you're trying to predict, and again, this is a flood flood hydrology example, but if you're trying to predict flow at a given site based on some of observed flow at a nearby site, um, what a confidence interval tells you is it tells you the average that the average flow at our site, given all the times we've observed um, flows of a thousand CFS at the other site, right, is described by the confidence interval. So the average flow at our site, given all the times we've observed a thousand CFS, so this is like the repeated sampling kind of concept that we saw with confidence intervals. Um, the average flow should fall within that confidence interval you know, uh, a percentage of the time that is equal to the percentage that goes with that confidence interval. And then the prediction interval is what interval approximates the predicted flow at our site given a single observed flow at 1,000 CFS. So again, this is the one that's probably more practical, more intuitive, that if we see 1,000 CFS at the nearby gauge, what's the, you know, what's the probability that our the flow at our site is, with, is within um, a defined interval, right? And that's provided by the prediction interval. So again, that's a little bit analogous with the Bayesian credible interval. And is, again, in a lot of applications, probably more practical and useful and more intuitive. Um, as I mentioned before, we have to estimate these at each value or overall values of X. So, at each point, we have a confidence interval, and then we do it over the full range of our X values, and that gives us a confidence band um, that is basically a line drawn through all those points that connect um, the confidence intervals we've calculated at each value of X, and prediction band is the same thing for a prediction interval. So uh, ways we can interpret these things, and again, these, these align with the frequentist versus Bayesian kind of concepts and interpretations. So if we have a confidence interval, we might say we're 95% confident that the average flow at our site over many observed flows of 1,000 CFS at the nearby gauge falls within our confidence interval of 850 to 1,100 CFS. And then the prediction interval, we're 95% confident that the flow at our given site uh, is between 800 and 1150 CFS, given that we've observed a flow of 1,000 CFS at the nearby gauge. So again, in my opinion, the prediction interval is a little more useful and, uh, and um, practical. Both confidence and prediction intervals, they, they are um, narrowest near the mean value, and they are widest as you get farther away from the mean value, you see this same behavior in uh, when you do uncertainty on distribution fittings. Uh, the reason for that is values are, uh, more of the values are gonna generally be closer to the mean, which means you generally have more data, which means you generally get a more accurate prediction closer to the mean. And as you move farther away from the mean, your data generally gets more sparse, which means your model is gonna be less accurate, which means you have wider confidence and prediction intervals. And then the other one is that the prediction intervals are always going to be wider than the confidence intervals. Um, the reason for that is the confidence intervals are based on this concept of repeated sampling that's looking at conceptually an average over all the values. So um, you end up with a narrower, narrower band of values um, than a prediction interval where you're basing it only on a single, uh, a single value. 